Hi, this is Dr. Bosch, and I just want to take a few minutes to talk about the autonomic nervous system. It's not a very complicated system, but I find sometimes that if students don't get the big picture of what it is, then it just seems to be difficult to understand. So let's start with this chart that you're seeing in front of you with some very basic information. One is the autonomic nervous system is always motor, always motor. See how it's in a motor division? It does not send information back up to the PNS to the CNS. So keep that in mind. Any question about the autonomic nervous system, it's a system that makes glands squirt or makes muscles move, but it makes things happen. They're all motor neurons. Now, before I go on to the next slide, I also want you to notice that it is made up of two divisions, sympathetic, often called our fight or flight reaction, and parasympathetic, often called our rest and digest system. Now, before we leave this slide, another important point about the autonomic nervous system. It is always working. Right now, as you listen to this, your sympathetic division is working and your parasympathetic division is working. These are running all the parts of your body, which is mostly your smooth muscle and cardiac muscle, that you don't consciously control. So you can't sit there and say, okay, stomach, let's churn. It just does it. It's called autonomic. If you think of automatic, you're kind of on the right track. So this runs all of the body systems that we don't really think about. They're done kind of in the background. But again, they're always working. If a bear is chasing you around a tree, then your sympathetic is very dominant at that moment. If you're sitting back in your chair, just chilling, your parasympathetic is more dominant. But both of these are working all the time. So the parts of the body that are affected by the autonomic system are, as I mentioned, the smooth muscles, the cardiac muscles, and the glands. They're called effectors because they do something. So these are all motor neurons. Another thing I want to show you from this slide is that in the autonomic nervous system, and no one has really explained why, but in the autonomic nervous system, there are always two neurons two sets of neurons. One that comes first, so these are going out, right, because it's motor. They're leaving the central nervous system and going out. And the first neuron is called preganglionic. That's a ganglion, a, a group um, of cells right there. And this is called postganglionic. Postganglionic. So preganglionic and then post ganglionic. Another thing to see from this chart is that the parasympathetic system, our rest and digest, starts either here in the brain, in the brain stem to be exact, or all the way down here to the sacral region. So we call that a cranial sacral system. See how there's no parasympathetic all the way from here all the way down to there. In the same way, the sympathetic system is more central. It starts in the thoracic region and goes down to the lumbar region. So we call thoracolumbar. The way I remember this is if I'm really scared, it kind of hits me right in the gut and that's in the middle of me. And the sympathetic system comes from the middle of your spinal column whereas the parasympathetic comes from the brain and way down to the sacral region. Lastly, let's take a look at the length of these fibers. In the parasympathetic system, the preganglionic fibers, remember we always leave the central nervous system go out, so pre would be first. The preganglionic fibers are long 
and then the postganglionic fibers are short. In other words, this would come almost to your eyeball or to your eyeball, have a synapse, and then the second neuron is fairly short. And that's true of all the parasympathetic fibers, very long pre, very short post. The sympathetic is just the opposite. It has a very short preganglionic fiber that goes to the sympathetic chain ganglia, which are very close to the spinal cord. They show them a little farther away so you can actually see it. But in reality, this chain of ganglia is right next to the spinal cord. So this the pre is very short. And look at the post. It's got to go whoa all the way up to the eye or all the way over to the salivary glands. A couple other differences. The myelination is missing in the postganglionic autonomic axons. So in the autonomic system, once you get to the ganglia, this does not have myelin. In the somatic system, the, the kinds of neurons we've been looking up at up to this point, the myelination goes all the way to the end and is completely myelinated. On the autonomic system, it is myelinated up to the ganglia, but after that, it's just kind of a naked neuron. There's no myelin in the postganglionic neuron. Another difference is that with the somatic system, what we've learned so far, the neural transmitter is always acetylcholine, ACH, and that is still true of the parasympathetic system. It still produces ACH, but for the sympathetic system, our, our uh, fight or flight system, norepinephrine is used. This is the same chemical that is released by the medulla of your, of your adrenal gland um, in response to um, some sort of emergency. So the actual neural transmitter is norepinephrine, which will stay around a little bit longer in case of emergency. Now, lastly, what does this system do? Well, on the parasympathetic uh, side in that division, we call it rest and digest because this, these are the kinds of actions that are done when you're quiet, when you're not in an emergency state. So for example, you will digest your food and move it along. You'll clean your blood with your kidney and produce urine. So urination and defecation, those are really tied to your parasympathetic system. And then all the rest of these, if you look through the list, you'll see that they are always the kinds of actions that can be done when you're not in any kind of emergency situation. The sympathetic system, in contrast, is what occurs when you are in more of an emergency situation. So for example, the pupils of your eyes will get really wide and open because you've got to see what's going on. You'll need more blood glucose. You won't have blood going to your digestive or urinary tracts. Why bother working with that when there's a bear chasing around a tree? So we'll go to your, the um, blood will go more to your heart, your brain, and your skeletal muscles. Your heart rate will increase. Your blood pressure will increase. You'll start sweating. Your bronchioles and your lungs will dilate so you get lots of good oxygen going there. So on a question on the exam, there's lots of these kind of matching questions. Just think about what, what goes on when you're resting and then what goes on when you're in an emergency. Now, having said that, I'll go back to what I said earlier. Your sympathetic system is always doing some of this, right? You need your heart to go. Your parasympathetic is always doing some of this. The only difference is that in a truly emergency situation, you do more of this. And in a, if you're just sitting and studying or relaxing on the couch, it's more parasympathetic. I hope this information was helpful. Uh, within this chapter, you'll see long lists of things that are more sympathetic and more parasympathetic. And one thing that we looked at in the chapter is what kind of functions are only sympathetic and which are parasympathetic and which ones kind of work together. 
and actually sexual intercourse involves both systems. If you need your parasympathetic system for an erection, and that'd be true of both the penis and then blood flowing into the clitoris. But then the actual ejaculation um, is sympathetic. So we kind of somewhat jokingly say you need a point and a shoot. You need a parasympathetic for the erection. You need a sympathetic for the ejaculation. So um, between these two, they'll work together um, to produce a successful um, sexual reproduction, sexual intercourse. And I'll end with this. Um, do understand what controls this. If you're asked for just what's the biggest control, say the hypothalamus. That's the part of your brain that really controls the ANS. But we do know that when we're afraid, that's part of that fight and flight reaction. That's your limbic system in your brain, which is part of your, um, can have effects on a cerebral cortex. So um, just thinking about something very calming can make you more parasympathetic. And then thinking about the awful thing that happened yesterday can make you more sympathetic. And, and so what you think about can actually affect your autonomic system. So being relaxed, you'll be more parasympathetic. Being stressed and upset, you'll be more sympathetic. Okay, I hope this was helpful. And of course, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me.